at uh, chapter 7 and I'm going to read from verse 11 through to 17. So Luke chapter 7, uh, 11 through to 17. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. And as he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. And then he went up and touched the bier. They were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. And they were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. We ask that the Lord will bless his word to us. We're at uh, Luke chapter 7 and we're looking at those verses 11 to 17. But before we do that, I'm going to pray. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your word now, uh, we acknowledge that we need you to speak to us. Um, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would illuminate uh, Jesus' words to us, that we might see who he is, that we might acknowledge the power that he has in our lives, and that we might be changed. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. So I want to speak to you from, uh, about the issue of fr from death to life, um, from Luke 7, 11 to 17. Now this last year in, in our garden at home, um, we had uh, some brown patches on, on the lawn. Um, so areas last year, I think probably we had a paddling pool out and the grass never recovered and it was barren. There was nothing growing there. So what do you do when you've got barren soil? Well, you plant seeds, don't you, in the hope that uh, the grass will come up and so that's exactly what we did in some areas that was quite successful in others not so um, but there is something of a joy isn't there if you go to a barren area of land and you plant something there and in God's grace it grows something exciting about that isn't it something that's gone from being barren and, uh, and not producing any fruit of any kind to life being in its place to being exciting and there are times in our lives, aren't they, where we are brought low and we cannot see the way ahead. Then out of seemingly nowhere, a friend comes and brings hope for the future. They either meet a need that we couldn't, or they show us the path uh, through the obstacles that we hadn't been able to see our way through. It's good when we experience those things, isn't it, to have those transformations take place in our lives. We love those kind of moments. We delight in the newness of spring, don't we? When we get through winter and everything's barren and the trees look drab and, uh, and, you know, the skies are always depressing and then spring comes and new life is there and, and we get excited, don't we? We are thrilled when that happens. We, we rejoice. Suddenly, uh, you know, we can start wearing uh, thinner jumpers and, and uh, T-shirts come out and some people get straight into their shorts. I've never fully understood that. I've never been a shorts kind of a, a guy. I wear them only when it's really hot and on the beach. But um, I, outside of that, I'm not kind of into shorts that much. But, but folks are like that, aren't they? It excites us. Things are changing. There is wonderful new growth. There is new, uh, newness of life there, vibrancy of life and the joys that flow from that. Well, here Jesus is speaking to us of such a change, such a transformation that takes place in uh, a woman, uh, a widow, and her son's life. And so I want to speak on three things from this passage, and the first is the prerogative of Christ in verses 11 to 13. Now, Nain is 25 miles from the so to the southeast of Capernaum, or, or thereabouts, at least that's what's thought in today's thinking um, 25 miles further away from where we met Jesus last if you remember he was in Capernaum and uh, we don't actually read in this passage particularly but we don't actually read as to why Jesus has gone to Nain in fact the only reason we really know that he's gone there 
Um, yes, he's to carry out his ministry, but we might suggest that he's actually got an appointment there. Uh, that's the only reason that we're given. We're not told why he traveled those 25 miles on, on foot. Uh, we are simply find that he comes to this town. And he comes to this town at a specific point in the town's life, and most specifically in the life of this widow and her son. Now, large crowds are following Jesus. That text brings that out for us. It tells us, here is Jesus. He's a, a great teacher or, or thought to be amongst the people. And so following him are large crowds. And his reputation has obviously gone before him into many ways, uh, many places. But what is notable is that the widow and the son are, are not in that crowd. They're not in the crowd of the followers of Jesus. In fact, we don't get any hint that they've had any thought about Jesus at all. There is no concept of him, perhaps, in their thinking as he turns up on the scene. Now, obviously, on the day that they're there, they can't be in the crowd. There's uh, something else that's happening in their life that is, uh, uh, that is taking precedence. But the te text gives us no hint that there is any thought for the things of Jesus. There is no mention of their faith. No, as you read through the passage, there is no thought to the faith either of the widow or, or of the son who has died. There is no mention of that, which is uh, considering we've just come from uh, the uh, centurion who has shown great faith. It's interesting to discover that there is no thought of faith in this particular passage. Neither of them has asked Jesus for help. Neither of them have shown any interest in him. And even as the woman sees Jesus coming towards him and towards her uh, and uh, maybe knows something of what he is, there is no plea for help. There is no cry out for Jesus to come and to speak to her. Now, it's the woman's greatest hour of need. She has a dead son and no husband. Well, in the world in which we live in, that perhaps doesn't seem to be such a, a great difficulty. Um, we feel the loss. We would understand that, uh, you know, you've lost your husband and, uh, and you've grieved for him and now you've lost your son and, and no parent ever wishes to outlive their ch children. So we can feel the pain in that sense. But perhaps we don't fully grasp the desperateness of this lady's situation. She has no man in her life. Uh, I know that that's not a popular thing in our, in our age, in, uh, that women should rely upon men, but that such was the situation in that time and place. She had no man in her life, no husband to look after her, no son to provide for her. She is, is in effect, coming to the point of destitution in her life. She's coming to a place where as she looks forward there is little hope for the future. She is now reliant upon the kindness of others around her and I don't know about you if you've ever been in that situation that's not a particularly comfortable place to be is it when you are reliant upon the goodness or the grace of others around and about. You are concerned for the future so not only is she dealing with this great weight of grief not only is she dealing with the fact that her son has just died and because of the nature of the, uh, of the hotness of the country, uh, she ha he has literally not died very long before. Um, so her son has passed away and now she's got the whole facing of this funeral before her. She's had to march out before the town and, and such was the tradition in those days that um, even if she didn't have a large family, what would happen is as the funeral procession came by, if you saw the funeral procession, you would line up behind and follow out. There would be a sense of, of joining it. We don't quite get that in our days today. It used to be such in the past. And, and when famous people have died, uh, you know, people go out and line the streets, as it were, to pay, res pay their respects. But we don't so much get it when um, local folk die in that sense. Uh, but that would have been the, tra the traditional situation. And so though there's a large crowd following her, she perhaps does not feel anything of the comfort of that she may well be concerned about all that is to come and she is probably weeping very bitter tears indeed the weight of all of this is heavy upon her so it's the woman's great hour of need but it's also the son is beyond help isn't he he's in the grave he is well he's not quite in the grave yet but he's getting there um he's dead 
as far as we're concerned, it's all over. Uh, as far as humanly speaking, we think that uh, it's, well, it's gone beyond the point of anyone being able to help this man. So it is a desperate situation that Jesus comes into. It is a desperate situation that he sees. And where are they heading, these two? And the crowd that follows? Well, they're heading out of town. They're heading to the place where the dead are, are buried, are put to rest outside of the city. The place of reproach, as we would understand it, the place of corruption, the place that is reserved for those who can't be helped any longer. Uh, and Jesus, as it were, meets them as they come to the gate, the place uh, at which they are really on the cusp of, of getting to that place that they will receive, in, in a sense, no more help from. Well, Jesus does something which is completely out of the ordinary. Instead of doing what the custom beheld, which would be to join the crowd behind and to follow on, the Lord Jesus Christ makes a beeline for the widow who is at the front of the procession. And he seeks to speak with her, which was very unorthodox, very surprising, not the kind of thing that would normally happen. And as he goes to her, he says the strangest of things, doesn't he? As he goes to this woman who is in this place of great bitterness, tears rolling down her face, and Jesus walks up to her and says, don't cry. Now, if you were in that situation, I wonder how you would have felt, uh, you know, this strange man that you've never really met before, and he comes bowling up to you on the one day that you'd think that you had the license to cry, you know, on the one day when everything seems to have gone so badly wrong that surely nobody could suggest that you shouldn't cry, and Jesus comes up to her, and says, don't cry. Her son has only just died. He'd been uh, anointed and was off to be buried. You know, often in lives, Jesus' interruption feels, well, can feel less than welcome. Here they are, they're going about their daily life, as it were. Not their daily life in the sense that they didn't die every day, but you know what I mean. Uh, it was not their life. They, it was just proceeding on, and it was a dreadful situation. The son was dead, the mother is left. And to have somebody bowl up to you on the funeral procession and say, don't cry, well, that wouldn't be enough to make you cry all the more, wouldn't it? That would be enough to you to say, well... Has, has no one got any compassion in these days? Does no one care? Uh, can I not even grieve in peace? And you know, sometimes when Jesus comes into a life, he comes in such a way as that, well, it throws us off guard. It throws us off balance. And we wonder what it is that he's come to do. Unsought after, uh, unwelcome in many ways. And Jesus meets us right there at our moment of, well, deep pain, deep hurt, a crossroads in our life, we might suggest. And as he comes, you know, much as the picture that uh, Christians like to paint of the Lord Jesus Christ, sometimes he comes and, and it's stark. It's a difficult meeting. And no doubt as she looks at Jesus, she wonders what this is all about. What does this all herald for her? But I want you to notice that the text tells us most specifically that Jesus comes with compassion he has seen the plight of this lady he has seen the, the the direction her life is going in she he has seen the son and the fact that he has no life and he comes with compassion now it might jar in her life that he's come but you may depend he has come to speak grace into her life he has come to change her life, to radically turn it around in a way that she would never expect. I'm sure Gary can attest to this, but sometimes when you speak to people out in the open air or, or on the doors who have never thought about the Lord Jesus Christ before, they can, they can be quite bolshy and up in your face and tell you that they want nothing to do with it. And then Jesus himself just touches their lives. He pulls them up short and they've got no more excuses to make. They've got no more 
ways around dealing with Jesus. He is just there right in front of them and they need to hear him out. They need to listen. And because of Jesus' grace in a person's life, because of his compassion, he speaks to their souls. But I want you to note that that's always Jesus' prerogative. You know, as a church, we want to do evangelism. We want to do all manner of things in which we might reach those who are without the Lord Jesus Christ. But I, I promise you this, that unless, the, unless Jesus is the one with the appointment, those that we meet, those that we speak to, will never turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, will never experience his grace, because it is a work that only he can do. He alone can awaken a soul. Now, that doesn't take from our responsibility. We are to hold out the gospel to everyone. We do not know those appointments. We do not know those times when Jesus will appear in a person's life and turn it completely upside down. So our responsibility is to take the message out. But here it is, the prerogative of the Lord Jesus Christ to reach into a person's life, though they may not expect him, and to bring them to the point at which they will see what he will do. And that's what I want to speak to you, of you, ne of you, to you next. The power of Christ comes out in verses 14 and 15. As Jesus meets these two, uh, the widow and her son, they are heading out to the place of corruption, to the place where there is no more hope as far as they're concerned. Yet I want you to understand that that place held no fear for Jesus Christ. He was not concerned about that impurity, that corruption. Now Jesus is aware that there are laws concerning touching corpses. He knows that there are, are laws, uh, Levitical laws, about uh, going even near to the uh, coffin, as it were, to the, to the briar, as it's called here. But Jesus does not pause. It causes him no concern. He goes directly to the procession and he puts his hand upon uh, the, where the young man is. And we see the power of Christ, first of all, in his authority in which he brings the funeral procession to a halt. Uh, like I've said, this is unheard of. Normally you, fi you file in behind um, and you allow the procession to go on by, by quietly. You, you, we do get to see that sometimes in our day, don't we? we? People are kind and gracious and they let the hearse go out in front um, when they're out on the road. But Jesus doesn't do that. He stops everything dead. This is a whole town that's come out to witness this burial. And, and just by standing in front of them, he stops the whole lot. But then what he does next is he demonstrates that he has power over death. Here we, we see what Jesus can do, as it were. This man who has died, who has no hope as far as we're concerned, as far as all of those around who are watching are concerned, Jesus simply speaks to him and how do you speak to a dead person i mean you can go down to the local morgue if you like and you can open up one of the drawers and you can uh, uh you know have a a chat to any one of the corpses you can speak you can be there probably for a, a good number of hours uh, and i can fairly much guarantee that not one of them will stir nothing will happen they won't hear a word you have to say but here is the lord jesus christ he stops the procession and he speaks to this young man and tells him to sit up. Now, if you were in that crowd, there would have been a moment or two as you've paused and you've taken all of this in and you're a little bit concerned, what kind of man is this? Is he a madman? Uh, you know, is he going to just create a scene and, and he going to uh, yeah, ruin this day for, for this widow? He's speaking to dead people. And he's telling a dead person to sit up. What's even more astonishing is that the dead person sits up <laughs> and he begins to speak. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ has power over life and death. 
Nobody in that crowd was expecting that. I doubt even those that were his disciples were expecting that. But when Jesus speaks, he has the power over life and death. More than that, he has the power to bring hope where there is none. Imagine if you were the widow on this occasion and, uh, you know, this man, he's come up to you, he's told you not to cry and you're a bit bemused by all of that in the first place. And then he goes to your son and he tells your son to sit up. At this point, you really would be confused. And then on top of all of that, your son sits up and speaks to you. Well, probably a scream might burst out at that point. Uh, there would be some degree of, of what on earth is going on here. But then there is the realization that all the things that you feared before have suddenly been answered in the coming to life of your son. All of the troubles and the worries that you were having, knowing that you were going to have to deal with, you know, once you've gone through the horrible process of putting your son in the ground, then you've got to go back and live your life. And, and, and all of those things that had swum in your mind and thought, well, there's no hope here. Here comes the Lord Jesus Christ. And suddenly there is real hope. Suddenly there is a future. Suddenly there is purpose. For this widow and this son, there is now a future where there was none. Now, what does this all tell us? Well, it helps us to understand in picture form, doesn't it? It helps us to see what Jesus will do for any who are dead in their sin. The Bible tells us that each one of us in our natural state is dead in sin, that we are corpses, that it, when it comes to the things of God, we aren't interested. And in fact, you know, like we're like dead men walking. We are deaf to anything that God has to say. We can't even see him. We just carry on our lives regardless. We are not interested in the things of God in any way. We are dead, spiritually dead in our sin. I want you to notice that Jesus makes all the running. They didn't have to do anything. Jesus made all the running for this couple, for this mum and her son. He was the one who found them. He was the one who did everything that was necessary to bring him back from the dead. And we need to understand that that's exactly what Jesus does in our lives, if we know the Lord Jesus Christ now, and in the lives of those in our family that we know and love. At the moment, it may, may look hopeless. As we think about our relatives, and some of them just are not interested in God at all. And they may have been to Sunday school. And they may have heard all the ways in which they should trust the Lord Jesus Christ. And at this moment, there is no life there at all. They are just dead. And we, as parents and as loved ones, we, we, we get despairing at times, don't we? Lord, can you save them? Will you speak to them? Well, when Jesus Christ speaks, the dead are brought to life. Those who appear to have no interest in the things of God are suddenly brought face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ and they are raised with him. He makes all the running and he comes to the helpless. From eternal death he brings eternal life. Now in the story it is, it is the natural life of the man that is returned to him and he will at some point later on in his life he will pass away again. This is only a small respite. But it points us to the bigger thing, that when someone trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes into their life and they are brought from death to life, spiritual death to eternal life, then they will live forever. No more will they see corruption in that sense. And how will he do that? Well, he will do that by going to the very place that they were going to. He stops them before they, goes at, they go out of the town to that place of corruption to that place of death to that place of hopelessness and it tells us when we think about it when we stop and we just pause and we remember that that's because Jesus himself would go there in a very short space of time he himself would go and pay the penalty that death 
Well, is the penalty off? The Lord Jesus would go outside of the city, as it were, and he would bear on a cross the punishment of all sin. And all who put their faith in him can be forgiven. All who put their faith in him are raised to new life. And he gives eternal life. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, and I know that there are some here in our congregation this morning that do not know Jesus as their Savior, let me please plead with you today. You do not know how many more days you have on this life. Today Jesus comes to you and he says, Look, I've given my life for you. I've paid your sin debt. There is nothing left to pay. All you need to do is trust me, believe in me, and you will be saved. Why do you dally? Why do you wait? Do you not want to have an eternal security, a future hope that no one can take from you because Jesus has given it? To you. He ensures that your future is taken care of. Uh, no more worries about security uh, and stability. Jesus becomes the guarantee of our future. The guarantor of our future. Uh, you know what it's like. Um, you know, we go out to work and uh, we have bills coming in on the other side. So we earn enough money, we hope to pay the bills. But sometimes think life gets a little tough, doesn't it? And what we've got coming in does not match what we've got going out. And we begin to worry and be concerned about our future. Well, this widow had found herself in that situation. She had no hope for the future. She had no security. She had no way forward. And the Lord Jesus Christ comes along and gives her security and a hope. And that's what he does for us as believers. He, un he makes it absolutely sure that our eternity is wrapped up. It is dealt with. It is a done deal. He simply needs to lead us to it. The power of Christ in a person's life is able to bring security. Is able to bring stability. Is able to bring eternity. The last thing I want you to see is the person of Christ, and that comes in verses 16 and 17. Now, this crowd has turned out for the funeral. They are suddenly no longer at a funeral. They're at a new birth. Uh, there's nothing like a change of uh, fortunes, is there? You know, you've gone out. Uh, you're all somber. Uh, you're expecting nothing but death and, and, and discomfort, and suddenly it's all turned around because the Lord Jesus has done a miracle. He who is dead, is now alive again. That's astonishing. But what does it do? It leads to worship. Do you know that? If you stop and think about what God does in a person's life, it cannot do anything else but lead you to worship, can it? So next Sunday, as we come and we witness those who are going through the waters of baptism, we are witnessing that God has changed those who were dead in their sin and brought them to new life. And you know we should sing well, shouldn't we? You know, I hesitate to criticize singing. Um, you know, it's been a tough year and we haven't done so much of it. So, you know, perhaps we're getting a little bit out of sorts. But sometimes when we sing these songs, we look like we're depressed. Okay? These are songs of joy. These are songs of celebration. A God who can bring life where there is death. Our souls should be lifted up and they should glorify him, shouldn't they? Now, now, I'm not a charismatic. I know that some of you come from a charismatic background. You won't find me dancing in the aisles and waving my hands in the air. But I trust and pray that when God looks at me, he understands that I'm singing from the depth of my heart. And that should have some outworking in the physical expression of that, shouldn't it? You know, if I truly am worshipping, if I'm truly singing these songs because I've seen that Jesus brings life where there is death, then I should be enthused, shouldn't I? And please forgive me if any time you look up out here at the front and I don't look enthusiastic about what I'm singing. The problem is sometimes that my mind is on the next thing that's coming. And that's a fault of mine that I have to work on. 
but goodness knows what some of your thoughts are on when I look around. <laughs> We need to praise him, don't we? We need to lift his name on high. And it should lead us to ask the obvious question, shouldn't it? Who is this? And that's what it does for the crowd. As they look at the Lord Jesus Christ, as they look at what he's done, they ask the obvious question, who is it? Who could do this? And they give us a couple of answers. The first is, oh, he's a great prophet. Well, in a sense, they're right, isn't he? Aren't they? This is the one that Moses spoke of. He said a prophet would come who would be like him, one who would have direct access to God, who would see God's face, uh, one who would speak the very words of God. And so here is Jesus, that very person. And then they say God has come to help his people. But even as they say that statement, they, they don't have in mind what we understand. They haven't grasped that stood before them. is not just any old prophet. It is the Messiah, the promised one of God. It is God himself stood before them, bringing life where there is death. This is God himself walking in their midst, on his way to the cross to buy them life. We should rejoice in such a saviour. We should rejoice in one who came and walked among us, who knows everything that we go through, all the hardship, hardships and all the pain, all the suffering, and yet is able to bring us joy, to bring us a future, to give us hope. Next Sunday, four will testify to the new life that they have received in Jesus Christ. Come and celebrate and praise God for what he has done but it's not just true for them it will be true for anyone who acknowledges who Jesus is the son of God come to rescue guilty sinners and this next week as you have opportunity make sure that everyone around you knows that Jesus is the son of God and that he's come to rescue them just pray every day Lord, grant me an opportunity to speak of Jesus today, to tell this dying world that has no hope that with Jesus there is hope. With him is eternal life. Let's pray. A loving Heavenly Father, as we've looked at these things this morning, we acknowledge, Lord, that while we don't get excited about Jesus in the way that perhaps we should, we acknowledge that we perhaps forget who he is at times. We've grown so used to the stories over the years. We've grown so used to hearing each Sunday what he does. We ask, Lord, that you'd give us a newness of vision, that we might be rejoicing in him. Not just today, not just in this service, not just as we sing the next song, but as we go through this week, that we would rejoice in the Son of God who came to ransom souls who came to bring life where there is death. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.